Hello and welcome to another episode of Don't Shit on the Bus. I'm your host, Adam Elmakais, tuning Mark, tuning in all the way from Los Angeles, California for episode number 71 with Matt Halpern. Matt is an amazing drummer, father, friend, teacher, educator, role model. He's just, he's a very good person. He's somebody I look up to a lot. Matt and I, we used to hang out or we think we cross paths at shows. We know we must have. We kind of, you know, we hang out in the same circles. And eventually we actually worked together when Matt was helping out on Warped Tour with a thing called Think TEI, which was my first time doing a workshop over and over and over. I've done them like a few times here and there, but I did these ones on Warp Tour that he kind of helped me set up where I do it every day. Like you could buy a ticket to it and we get like 20, 30 kids a day and I do a workshop for an hour. It was, it was really cool. But anyway, I follow Matt since then. We keep in touch loosely. And I think that he has a very balanced life or rather an intentional balance to his life. And he does a good job balancing being a father, being a musician, working on his personal and professional projects. And that comes with a lot of practice, self-control, discipline. And that's what we talked about today. We talked about his interpersonal skills with his band, within his relationship, and how he maintains kind of this steady, healthy life in a not so steady, healthy kind of career. I mean, touring is pretty extreme, right? You're gone for a long period of time, then you're home. You, you know that if you've toured, and if you haven't toured, you can imagine what that's like. It's, it's difficult. And so, Matt, we went kind of deep and I felt like I got life coached. It was nice. Like, I left this podcast feeling very inspired. And I appreciate Matt for taking time to sit down and talk with me for an hour um, because it was really nice. So thank you, Matt. I, I appreciate that. And I think you guys will really enjoy this episode as well. With that being said, before we get into the episode, thank you so much to our patrons. Of course, every week you make this podcast possible. I got website fees. I got Connor fees. I got Eva doing awesome things. Now updating our Instagram. Yes, she is with very cool graphics, little informational tidbits. This week, we can welcome Stephanie. I am not going to try to say your last name. I never say last names anyway. But Stephanie, thank you for signing up, supporting the podcast weekly. I appreciate it dearly and deeply. And I'll see you on the Discord. With that being said, thank you so much for joining us for episode 71. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Don't Shit on the Bus. I will see you next week. Hello, Matt. Welcome to the podcast. How are you doing, man? I'm good. It's good to see you. It's good to see you too. Where Where are you at right now? So I live in Baltimore. Okay. That's where you're from too. You just, you stayed. That's awesome. I stayed. Yeah. I traveled enough everywhere else that like, I didn't necessarily feel the need to pick up and go. And then when I met my wife, who is very rooted here, it was just kind of like, all right, we're, we're staying. So that's that. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. I get it. And when I said you stayed, I don't know why I sounded surprised. Like I, if it was up to me and I could stay where I grew up and still do my career, I probably would do that too. Yeah, it's just, I, I don't know. I, don't, I never felt the need. Although I will say there are certain things that make it appealing to live in other places, such as like consistently good weather or like <laughs> taxes, things like that. But uh, I'm definitely happy to, to be here with my family. Yeah. And congrats on creating a family. How old is your child now? So my son is, uh, he'll be, he's almost a year. He'll be 11 months uh, this month. That is exciting. Pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty crazy that it's been a year so far. I know it's cliche, but it does fly. Dude, that is the story I hear from everybody. And I can't imagine. It's probably like a whirlwind that I can't, I'm just like so envious of people that get to experience that because I'm looking forward to it so much in life. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean that so deeply. How, how's the first year with your son? It's the best. I mean, it like, to be honest, I didn't know what I what to expect. You know, you hear yeah. all these stories. Um, I've heard good and bad. You know, I've heard people be like, "Oh, you know, good luck uh, having a relationship with your wife after your kid's born," or I've heard like, you know, say goodbye to sleep. Yeah. We really haven't experienced anything negative in those two areas, honestly. Like, we've maintained a great relationship. He has done really well with sleeping. I mean, I I am a big proponent of education and I'm not afraid to learn from people who have done it beforehand. So early on, we took this course that was all about like sort of about sleep training, yeah. but mainly for the purpose of like making sure your your child is getting enough sleep and getting enough nourishment. So when you learn those things and apply them, it actually we found that it really worked well. So we were getting pretty good sleep like from the beginning and you know, all that stuff's been great. I'd say the the coolest stuff is just like the milestones, like, you know, when they they start 
saying dada or mama or when they start oh, eating man. solids or when they start sitting up or i mean my son is definitely my son because the minute music comes on <laughs> he's like bouncing to the beat and he's like he does does this thing where he like waves his arms and like it's just he's musical it's it's so obvious you know that's amazing i'd say the only thing man that that has been sort of crazy that i didn't expect is just how much i guess how much it's affected me in terms of like I don't know if it's the, a wake up call is the word is the way to describe it, but you know, it just shit just gets very real in, in so many ways. Things that were not as serious prior can have a lot more weight to them. So whether that's like you know financial, like you hear certain parents like when they have a kid, they start working crazy hours because they just can't mm-hmm. um, they can't risk not bringing in you know the the, the level of income that they, that they need to have this safety to support their family or. You know, if you have any sort of health issue that pops up, it becomes so much more serious in your mind because it's like, well, there's way more, you know, at risk, I think, or way more at stake rather. So I've experienced some of those things and um, it's been interesting. I'm trying to wrangle that. Yeah, man. It, it's, I think that your success with everything is definitely tied to your openness to learning. And it's interesting to me that you said, you know, the people you talk to often mention these well, I would say there were negative aspects of having a child or things they really dealt with and struggled with. And maybe through that, you learned it was more of a reflection of them than their children, or it could be a, a variety of things. But when somebody now tells you that they're expecting, what are you going to tell them? Like, are you going to, you're probably not going to be like, get ready for sleepless nights. What What are you going to say? No, not at all. I mean, I, I, my, my uh, other business partner, Adam Getgood just had a baby a few months ago. So for months, I was just, you know, making sure that he knew that I was there to answer questions. And I was very honest with him from day one of like, this is not going to be as crazy as everybody is making it out to be. And you're not going to lose as much sleep as you (laughs) think. And your life isn't going to be like turned upside down. It's going to be awesome. You're going to have a new obsession, which is your kid. And it's going to make you feel driven and happy and energized, you know? That's what I would tell somebody. I don't want the, you don't want a parent to go into it scared. You want a parent to go into it excited. And I think more often than not, you uh, you can look at it that way. I like that. A new obsession is definitely a good way to uh, a phrase it. Do you think that because you've you know experienced obsessions that are your career and your life and involve touring, that that kind of gave you some tools to better deal with how you approach this and how you handled it as it happened? I don't know if anything would prepare you for for. <laughs> what it's like to have a kid to be honest but you can tell i don't have a kid <laughs> yeah and that's all i mean hopefully you will experience it at some point because it's it really is uh it really is a great experience but it's just a different level of feelings and that's the thing that you can never prepare for i mean look you've toured the world we've seen a lot you know we've mm-hmm. seen a lot of things and like you encounter all sorts of different challenges and all sorts of different scenarios but you know i don't think any of them are as sort of heavy or emotionally like impactful as having a kid now i can't say how i'll feel when i actually get back on stage after not playing (laughs) for over two years that could be pretty emotionally impactful yeah but but i I think what the if i could answer that question another way i think the fact that i have done a lot of things and experienced a lot of things makes it so that i can like feel more sort of steady and like experiencing like less FOMO of outward things. And I can devote more time to being home and being with my my son and not feeling like I'm missing a lot of other stuff, a lot okay. of other things, because I've experienced a lot of cool stuff. So yeah, I don't know. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. I mean, if I were to kind of try to repeat it back to you, you, you can find calm in your lack of activities for yourself right now, because you've done so much that this is so new in its own way, even if it's not the way you are used to doing activities, I guess. I don't know. That's kind of how it appeared in my brain. Hearing you say that though, it's funny, it brings up a whole other point, which is there's a, a flip side to that, which is at the <laughs> same time, having been so active and busy and out and seeing new places every day and experiencing new things every day, uh, you really do miss that. And that's the part that if there's anything that I think I've learned about myself through this process and not even just the baby, COVID, like Mm -hmm. that experience of just being home and being, you know, sort of sedentary as a lifestyle. It's not for me. It's great. And it's okay because I have my family at home. You know, that that's a good reason to be home and and it makes it 
okay. But I definitely need travel. I definitely need new places, new people, new experiences. I need to play music and just live that life. Like it, it, it's become very apparent to me that that is something I should never give up. Yeah, you've lived it for so long and it's probably a big part of you. And if you saw me typing during that, I was Googling sedentary because I didn't 100% know what it meant. But no, now I know. Good. And that yeah. makes sense. You know, that is, uh, I know you do sit when you play your instrument, but by no means are you, you know, in one place. And so more or less, did COVID allow for you to have a child? Was that something you're like, hey, or was it, like, I don't know if it's too personal to ask people. And no, if, if it, it is, happened. feel free to correct me. Like, it just happened. Okay. I was felt yeah. uncomfortable like, going into that. I was like, I don't know the rules on this. Okay, it just no, happened. No, no, no. It's fine. Um, no, it just happened. I mean, we just were kind of like, once we got married, we wanted mm -hmm. to take some time, obviously, for ourselves. But at one point, we were just like, all right, well, look, if it happens, it happens. And, you know, we're not going to necessarily be trying and counting mm -hmm. the days and all that stuff. But we're also not going to, like, not try at the yeah. same time so it just it happened you know and it was tough like when we so my wife and i initially we we went through a miscarriage we had a miscarriage when we first got pregnant which you know i i talk about that um because it's so common like what yeah. we learned from it was that it is incredibly common so many people go through miscarriages and it maybe it doesn't get talked about as much but a rough thing i imagine it's hard to talk it, about for, for yeah people. It's, it was rough it was definitely very rough it was it was a it was a hard thing to go through but you know it's it's extremely common and um going through that i think though made it all the more obvious to myself and my wife that we did really want to have a kid because when you lose the pregnancy it's either i know this sounds horrible but i think there's probably some people who who might have not wanted to be pregnant and they have a miscarriage and they feel relieved because now they're not and you know, you don't know people's situations. Maybe that's a reality. Mm -hmm. um, but for us, it was like it magnified the fact that we really did want to have babies. So it, it, when we did get pregnant again and things went well, it was just all the more sweet. You know, it was yeah. all it was all the more better to go through it that way. So yeah, man, it 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 happened, and we're we're you know now I can't imagine I can't remember aspects of my life before being a dad. <laughs> you know. Like what? You got you got to talk a little bit more to that. Is there anything that comes to mind? I really was interested in the unexpected life changes that happened from having a child. So that that kind of falls in that category. It just becomes your norm. And that's the thing. Like, yeah, you yeah. can think back to like when you weren't, but it's hard. You don't want to even imagine the world without your child in it. So it's yeah. like thinking about the past in that way is kind of strange and, and weird. And it's like, <laughs> so that's what I mean by that. I mean, I, look, I have traveled since since having him and I've I've done some really cool things since and like you feel this different sense of responsibility and pride when you go and you do those things and I still feel like myself completely like I still feel like you know normal me and I can click back into that gear mm -hmm. uh, or that mode you know but I think there's just a different drive behind it now and a different reason and a different thing you look forward to in the day it's like the thing that I'll look forward to now is if I'm away it's like when am I going to FaceTime you know, when yeah. are we going to, when are we going to talk? What's, and it also sucks because it's like, well, what am I missing? Because when, when they're this young, things happen every day. So you miss little things. And I remember coming back from my last trip and it was only like five or six days. And I was like, Man, he looks bigger. <laughs> you know, what did I miss? So it's stuff like that. How do you come to terms with like, what is the internal conversation been? Cause obviously, or maybe you aren't okay with it, but I'm assuming you've come to peace with, okay, I'm going to miss some things but that's okay because, you know, like how, how did you talk yourself through that? Man, I've missed a lot of things even before having a kid, right? Okay. Like we all do. We, we yeah. miss, I've missed every, I've missed every kind of thing. I've missed weddings. I've missed uh, birthdays. I've missed deaths, you know, yeah. like good and bad. You know, I went through an experience back in 2015. I was on tour in Europe and my dog died suddenly at home and there was nothing I could do. Yeah. So like when you go through things like that, you just kind of, learn to accept it and you learn that things can happen and you just try to be optimistic and do what you got to do. I will say though, from in my situation with my band, you know, we definitely, uh, even before I had a kid, we, we talked about the fact that we all have other things going on outside of the band and we need more time at home to be able to accommodate those things. So our touring had already slowed down in terms of the, the amount that we were touring and the frequency of the tours. And now that that still is very much in place. So we're very selective in 
typically we don't we usually don't go out for more than three weeks at a time. And that's typically pretty manageable. And we'll try to buffer it with a month or two in between as well. So that there's plenty of time in between and the trips are are pretty manageable. I think that helps a lot in those sort of uh being able to manage the the ups and downs and the things that you might encounter and the things you might miss. It's nice that you have a band that's on the same page and maybe in the same part of their life to be able to have that conversation and be like, okay, as a group, we're going to have more of a work-life balance because there very much are people who are work first constantly forever. And, you know, like, how did you guys have that conversation as a group? Did it just come up in a dressing room or did you like kind of all decide to have it? We, I mean, we, so as a band, one of the things that, that I think we do really well is we communicate with each other. That's sort okay. of been an important thing um, because in the past we didn't communicate well with each other and it caused problems. So we learned how to do that. And it became pretty obvious just because of different people's levels of burnout with different tours and different seasons of touring and different years of touring and record cycles and things that we had done previously. Mm-hmm. It was like, hey, like maybe we don't need to do all of this. We don't need to do it as often. We don't need to do it as much. In fact, and, and honestly for us, we found that it worked better for us to not be as accessible. You know, and there's, there's some bands that tour all the time, year round, they're always out, you know, and you can kind of predict their cycles. For us, we tend to do better when we are more sparse and less accessible. So it was a combination of everybody kind of realizing like we don't need to do this as much and it's actually nice to have the perspective. And two, when we did experiment with it, we actually felt like we had better results yeah. when we did our tours and when we would put our put out our albums. Man, that's interesting. And it's a good kind of, I was just trying to think of how I can af- like parallel that to my life or things I do and learn from that. And it, it's just, you know, I often look at what other people are doing and what success for the, for them. And I just assume or sometimes think maybe I shouldn't, but I think like, oh, I should do that too, because it will lead to success. But really that determines what you call success. And obviously your guys' priorities are for your business to do better, but you don't always have to work. You know, the cliche saying always work. You're working smarter in a way, not just harder. And you kind of figured out what worked for you guys, your life. And I mean, I don't think you could put a value on not arguing with your bandmates, you know, like that's great that everybody kind of is on the same page. Yeah. You know, it'll happen here and there still, but usually that it happens when people don't take the hard step to communicate, you know, like, Sometimes there's hard things to talk about, but if you talk about them, you typically can avoid big blowouts. Well, I was going to say, like, before you said you had have problems, you've had problems in the past because of a lack of communication. And I know that it doesn't get much closer than your bandmates other than your relationship. So some of these problems are probably pretty private. But do you have any that come to mind that are available to share with other people that maybe other bands could relate to or just people in general? Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing was there was a time in our in our band's career where if there were people that were annoying others on tour or doing <laughs> things that like, and you know, this happens all the time. People are yeah. quirky, but if, but if people continuously are feeling annoyed, usually they will then go and talk to their other bandmates about that person. And either the other bandmates will be like, Oh yeah, I agree with you. That person's annoying. Or they'll say, Oh, I haven't noticed that. And then the next thing you know, they're noticing it and it's driving them nuts <laughs> too. And it builds up this sort of like this bad energy, you know? Yeah. And, um, can't have that on tour. No. And it was things like that. And it was, and it really, it's, it's happened in every combination with every band member at one point in our band. But, uh, the bigger blowouts that occurred, you know, I had a, me and Misha definitely used to go through things like this. We would both like get frustrated with each other for different things, partially because we're very much alike in a lot of ways. And we, we are both the most outspoken in the band. We, we would knock heads and, he had a preconceived sort of, or I, I should say he had a, a an, an expectation of how I would react to things if he presented it to me. And I had a, an idea of how he would react to something if I presented it to him. <laughs> so we both avoided actually communicating. We just would talk shit on each other to everybody else. Yeah, how'd that work out? <laughs> it didn't work out well until we did have a blowout. And um, I, I don't know if I've told the story before, but it was, it was just, it was, it was a stupid, uh, catalyst for the blowout but it needed to happen it had to do with like who was going to shower first after the show i love the smile on your face right now like if you aren't watching the video it's just so key to the story like i can see you remembering it and being like why was this such a big deal but keep well, going like, right well I, I mean i always uh so i get real sweaty after i play yeah that makes sense and 
it's just not, it was never good for me. It wasn't good for my skin to like be sweaty for long periods of time. So I always like to like literally finish the show and get to a shower as fast as possible to clean up. And for whatever reason, amongst other things, this was something that was really bothering Misha. And there was one night we were in West Virginia. We were on a bandwagon at the time. This was okay. way back. And bandwagons actually had pretty nice showers. I remember trying to go and get in the shower, but he had purposefully tried to like beat me to it to see how <laughs> I would react. And I don't remember exactly what happened, but it it transpired into a big blowout, big argument. Yeah. Neither of us, everybody else got to shower before us because then we ended up sitting there in the lounge of the bandwagon talking about all of our issues with each other. And we both took it a lot better than we both expected us to take it. And we really hashed everything out and, and we made an agreement that at that point, from then forward, if we ever had an issue with each other, we would address it and we would do it in a way that wasn't involving others and, and was done in a calm manner. So like, hey, you know, Misha, Misha said to me, if you ever have a problem with me, come find me, say, hey, man, can we talk? And we'll go, we'll go for a walk or we'll go get a coffee and, and we'll, we'll talk it out. And we've maintained that, you know, since that, that time. And I think that was like 20, I don't know, 2011, 2012, maybe 2013, somewhere in that range. And, and since then, you know, we've become, we've gotten closer and closer. We've become really tight and we typically don't have any issues with each other. And then, so that, I think that uh, experience kind of bled over to the rest of the band and, and, they saw that that could work. So at different times, people would try to communicate that way. And, and over time, it got a lot better. That's sort of how it transpired. That's great. I, I'm just, I mean, I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, you joined the band in 2009? Yeah, like late 2008 or 2009. Yeah. So like, I mean, it's a good thing that happened in some way, like three years after you joined the band. And then from there, you guys are probably just learning so much. Because if that would have happened three years ago, it, I can't imagine what it is. It probably a less enjoyable experience to be in the band for those five or six years. So. Yeah. It's good you guys kind of figured that out early and figured out what made it work. And I'm picturing the night of West Virginia, like being a fan in the crowd and just seeing you and Misha running off stage, like really fast, trying to get to the shower <laughs> and the band, the, fan, like. the fans are like, where are they going? The sh well, what's the rush? <laughs> it's yeah. like, not what you would think. <laughs> yeah. And it's such a stupid thing. And, and you know, but it, that was the, uh, that was the incident that kind of broke the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah, I mean, when you're with people for how long you're with them on tour, and I'm sure anybody listening who tours understands, or even if you have a roommate or a best friend or your parents come visit you for a week, you know how that gets. Just imagine that's every year, all year. And I'm sure you were touring a lot back then too. Like everybody yeah. has to work first way more at the beginning of the career than they do later on. Yeah, a lot of people in close quarters too. That's the other, that's the other part, so. Yeah, I like that story. That's a good story. You should tell it more often. Yeah. There's, there's tons of stories like that. I think if I, if, if we, who knows, you might dig some more out of me. So. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to give them all away. I actually, I interviewed a guy who did a book on the, the office, the show, the office, and he interviewed all the members of all the people, like 72 different people involved with the show over the course of 10 years, pretty consistently. And I was like, how do you get all this information out of them? And he's like, you need to ask the questions that they don't have answers for already. And I was like, oh, that makes so much sense. But I never thought of that. Good. That's a great method getting good answers out of people for sure because i'm sure you would have been bummed if i got on here and i was like what's your favorite tour memory <laughs> and i just made you do all the hard work and digging it's too much at once it just comes yeah. you don't and then you can't remember anything how would you answer that it's so hard to answer that question yeah like like to you i have an answer that i've said before and then i thought about once and i just kind of keep it as my stock answer because it's too hard to dig around unless somebody takes you on that journey in my opinion there's too much that happens so have you gone back out with Periphery yet in this uh, since COVID or no? No. The, okay. closest, the closest thing was actually last, uh, last week. So through my software company, Get Good Drums, we yeah. work with um, the company Sweetwater, who okay. is a, a big music, online music retailer, and, and they have a store as well. But, but they, uh, they're one of our retailers. They, they sell our products. So myself, Misha, uh, and Dez, who are three of the four founders, went to go do sales uh, sales presentations for their whole sales engineering team. Part of that presentation was that me and Misha got to jam on stage in front of a group of people three times. You two of four. Different... Yeah, right. Two, uh, two of five. Five, excuse me. Okay, can I, can I admit here really fast something I fucked up on? Yeah. Well, okay. I want you to tell the story, but 
So for whatever reason, for the beginning half of our podcast, and now it's fine, Wikipedia was down. And I went to specifically double check my band count uh, thing. And I, that's why I got that wrong. So I oh, went to funny. check and it was 504 like forbidden. I was like, God damn it. Oh, anyway, that's okay. no, continue five. with your story. So I apologize. That's my fault. No, no, no worries. There used to be six, then it was five. So now okay. we're now we're five. But no, I mean, that was that honestly, like that was it. Me and me and Misha got a chance to perform together on stage. I was on an E kit, like an electric kit. Okay. We could show what the what the what our drum samples sound like in a big live room. Uh, and it was awesome. It reinforced like, oh yeah, this we missed the shit out of doing this. What so, a tease. Huge. Huge tease. Yeah. Well, I was trying to think the last time I saw you because my relationship with you is like, I actually don't know you through your band. I knew mm. you through TEI and Band Happy. And that's how yeah. I met you. So I learned about your band after I knew you. And I saw you at a San Diego show and you told me about Get Good Drums. And I'm pretty sure it was earlier on in it. So I, I, I follow along a little bit, but congrats on all your success, guys. Like, that's amazing oh, what thanks, you've done man. with that. It's, I'm sure Thank it's a you. lot of hard work, but it's so, it's awesome. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. It's a, it's a really cool project and a, and a cool company to, to have. And mainly because I get to work with two of my bandmates, one who's a former bandmate and then my other best friend. So like, yeah. that's, you know, pretty easy to work with each other, I should say. Yeah, what a dream come true. And do you think that all the skills you learn, whether it be, you know, the story you told about the shower and just talking, um, all those skills kind of lent themselves to being able to have like a successful career with your friends? Because there's always that saying of like, don't work with your friends. Don't, I mean, like, do you think that is possible because of all the skills you've gained over these touring years? Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, the interpersonal communication skills that you get from being in a band, or I should say, I should put it this way, the opportunity to get better at those skills. <laughs> there, there, there's nice. no shortage of those opportunities, right? And it's just a matter of whether or not you take them. And I think, I think the most successful bands that truly have longevity are the ones that do take advantage of those opportunities. Like if you really think about the bands that have succeeded, they're probably really good at communicating. They probably have a really good team around them. They probably communicate frequently about where they're at, what they want out of their career, what their goals are, what problems they have. Like I think the most successful partnerships or groups of people or company founders or bands have to do better the more they communicate. So yeah, I think the experience of being in a band for sure. And you know, all of us, the, the founders of, of Get Good Drums, we've all either been in a band together or like Des, our other partner, has had bands of his own. And it is typically has been like one of the band leaders in his band. So yeah. That definitely, you know, transfers over to our company. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. What a fun I don't know what a well-rounded life you've found within touring because that's not always the same. Like you, and it's all within the kind of the same space. Like you have your touring, you have your music, which is what you love to do, and then you have another job which relates to it, which you also get to do the thing you love with more people you love. Like, how does it feel to be where you're at in life? Also, adding the addition of a family and a, a wife. Correct? I got that right. Yeah. Wife. Yeah. Okay. Adding the addition of a, a son and a wife to your life. Like ten years ago, you know, two thousand. 11 arguing about showers like would you be stoked on where you're at now you think yeah definitely it's you have to you know i have to remind myself all the time of like the things that i am grateful for because I, as busy as we are it's just you know you stop and forget to, to do that sometimes or you know or you're thinking about what's next or you're thinking about what else you want to accomplish or what else you want to do and it's a question like that and a conversation like this that reminds you how great you have it. And you know, when I think back to even 2012, 2011, I mean, I can find things even then that I was super stoked about, you know, yeah. that I probably didn't even realize I like I wasn't even um grateful for at the time or at least acknowledging that gratitude. And it's the same thing now. It's like there's a million things to be grateful for. It's just am I doing enough every day to to acknowledge that, you know? And that's actually yeah. something that, you know, I don't know can't speak for everybody but for me it's really helpful to acknowledge um so i like my desk i'm looking at my desk right now i have all like at least two books on my desk that are like all about those kinds of things so i have what are they? um so this one is the daily stoic oh yeah i know about this yeah great book just read one passage a day it, it kind of reminds you of things that you should focus on and things that you should not focus on basically and good okay. ways to live your life and then this other book that i have here is probably one of my favorite books of all time it's called um, The Boy, the Mole, the Fox, and the Horse. I've never heard of that. 
I don't even know how I found it from some random post that somebody was talking about, but it's filled with like with like these illustrations, right? That's beautiful. Um, it's very cool, but it's just it's a beautiful book that is essentially a reminder of relationships and how to communicate, like how to communicate, how to how to love okay. one another, what's important, what's not, things like that. And it's done in a way that is not just like for kids. Like it could be a kids book, but it's definitely not. Like the first time I read it, I was like bawling my eyes out. Because yeah. Of how impactful it is. But yeah, I try to I try to practice that gratitude because it helps me be less anxious. It helps me be less um, impatient. Well, I love that. And uh, do you meditate? I feel like that's, I mean, I know people there, I, I know about Stoic through, oh my God, I'm going to blank on it. There's a meditation app that I use and uh, they had one about Stoicism. Am I saying that mm-hmm. right? Yes. Yeah, and that's, that's the only reason I know about it, but do you meditate or? Yeah, I do. Um, I've been working on finding the best methods for me to meditate, like what, what actually works the best. And I found that, you know, I do it different ways. Like sometimes I'll do it under like physical stress, meaning like in my sauna, like I have a sauna, so I'll kind of get into a meditative state there or we'll get in my ice barrel and I can meditate there and like extreme cold, which is a form of physical stress. But I honestly, like guided meditation doesn't really do the trick for me. Um, Something that I've gotten into more lately has been acupuncture. I don't know if people know this, but like when you, when you have acupuncture done, you know, the acupuncturist, they'll kind of ask you why you're there, what, what your reasons are. They'll place the needles in specific spots and then they leave you alone. They leave yeah. the room, turn it dark <laughs> and you're there laying there, really can't move with your thoughts for 30 minutes. And I've found that experience, forget the acupuncture part, but just laying down on the floor in a dark room and giving myself time to be quiet and still and just breathe has been the best forms of meditation. Okay. I leave those sessions feeling like so calm, so peaceful and lacking anxiety, which is very important. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, I, I feel like not that we got ahead of ourselves, but we organically found our spot here. But I wanted to know where in your career or your life you first noticed or became aware of anxiety um, in a way where you're like, oh, I should probably um, tackle this. I was young. Yeah, I was really young, man. I don't I, I mean, I've done a lot of digging and figuring out why, but round fourth or fifth grade, I was like nine or 10. I think it was probably after the loss of my grandmother. I started to feel like, I don't know if it was separation anxiety, but I think I was just a a fear of loss in general to a degree. And I remember when I started fifth grade, the first day my dad taking me to school, I was like nauseated and I like threw up from the anxiety. Remember that very vividly. The second day of school, right around 9 a.m. after I got there, I waited so class started and I said I was going to the bathroom and I literally ran home. Like I walked out the door and I went home because I was afraid that something was going to happen to my parents. I was afraid that they were either going to leave me or I don't know, something. And like that was the beginning of it. I don't, it's hard to pinpoint how long it stuck around at that point, but you know, I worked really hard even that at that point in my life to, to get better with it. My parents really went above and beyond to help me too. Like my mom would, um, we told all the kids that she was a chaperone in the in the elementary school, like like a hall monitor. But in reality, she would go for certain periods of day and sit in the hall so that I would know that she was there to help me wow. stay in school and like thank you, mom. Yeah, and and conquer it. So I learned coping me- mechanisms back then. But I think there's just been different points in my life where it's really kind of reared its head. I think it's always been there. It's always been like a low undercurrent, like a weird energy and. I think the busier I am, you know, the more active I am. Like when I'm on tour, for example, uh, or very active with the band, my levels are, of anxiety are so low because I'm just constantly on the move. I'm around other people. I got tons going on. I have so many distractions. I'm doing what I love. It's very easy to just not even think about it. It's, it's pretty great, actually. But when I have more idle time, it's more present. And I think more recently, after my son was born, it was like a, pretty big event, you know, and I think kind of what I was talking about before, the realization of the importance of the things you do and how they affect your family and the things you experience and how they affect your family can feel a lot heavier. And for somebody who has anxiety, it can really like make it flare up a bit. So I'd say when COVID started, I was super anxious. And then after I had my son, just different things would, would spark it, whether it be a small health issue or whether it be, uh, financial issue like when you do your taxes and you get a big bill or something like that it's like 
those things just feel a lot heavier. And I just try to, I'm trying to figure out now even the best ways to mitigate it. And I think what I'm learning is like the busier I am with things that I really enjoy help really help me to to be more present, be more grateful of what I have in the moment, and also to uh, to, to ease it, to ease the anxiety if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So I have this journal here where it's actually a lot harder to do. This this might sound grim in a way or weird, but like I'm ready. I was listening to a podcast with uh, the comedian Bert Kreischer, and yeah. he was talking about he was talking about how he started writing down all the things that he loves to do because he realized that if like, if he just stays in bed when he wakes up, it makes him feel like shit. And if he doesn't do good things, it makes him feel bad. So I was like, that's a that's kind of a really cool exercise. Like, <laughs> could I write a list of like five, 10, 20 things that I love to do that I can go and I can reference when I'm feeling anxious so that I can snap myself out of those moments. So <laughs> The hard, it's, it's actually like, it's hard to do the hard Like that's a, yeah. Other than the obvious, I mean, like we can all list drums, hang out with your significant other, hang out with your child. What are the ones that you found after you got rid of the 10 that you knew? Go for a walk, go outside and just get some sun, go to a, a coffee shop and just enjoy a really good coffee. Go for a drive to go get a meal that I really like. Oh, I like um, call a friend that yeah. I, that Call a friend that like is always down to talk about this kind of stuff. Yeah, right? I know the what more, you mean. The more I can communicate about it, the better. Find therapeutic things. Like I tried acupuncture and I found that like I really enjoy the process. I really enjoy how I feel afterwards. Um, and it's okay to be still during it. Like that's something that I'm learning how to do. Even though there's a needle like right here between your eyes that like waves into your view, you're like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a little strange, but yeah, you get used to it. At, like reading. I found yeah. that reading actually really chills me out. So if I can call on myself to go do these things, it does definitely help to, to lessen those periods of time when I'm anxious. And the things that you should not do are also really apparent. Like don't just sit and think. And don't go and look things up online when you're afraid of something. Like Dr. Google is the worst fucking thing <laughs> in the world because it's just always going to inevitably mean that you're fucked. Yeah. I have a headache. Oh, uh, you better go to the doctor. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, so like, you know, knowing what to do and knowing what not to do, knowing what behaviors are negative and bad for you and knowing what things you can do that are really good for you. So that's sort of the, the process that, that I'm trying to really dig into and figure out. I, I like the idea of writing it all down. Like, I feel like I have lists about my other lists at this point because I just forget so many things. And the hardest part for me is remembering the things that I should do when I'm in a maybe not good mood that I thought of when I was in a good mood. Because I feel like all those things you said, you're like, yeah, it makes sense to go on a walk. It makes sense to read a book. But when you're in a bad headspace, those things just don't come to you naturally. So having the list to refer back to, Seems like a really good tool to make sure that you're like, hey, a better version of myself told me these are good things. Let's do this now. <laughs> so I like yeah, that. Yeah. Well, because it's really hard. It's really hard to think of positive things if your mind is in a sort of cyclical, like spiral of neg- negative thoughts, right? That's yeah. what it could be. You know, it's funny. My, my, my therapist was saying to me, it's like, we have to figure out ways for you to slow it down. And sort of at one point where I was having a little bit of rough time, Pretty recently, actually, I mean, it's been, I've had some different bouts with anxiety. And Mm -hmm. she was like, your anxiety is like the bus from the movie Speed. It's just going and going and going, and you're not doing anything to really slow it down. So you got to figure out what things you can do to pull yourself out of it. And sort of, so that's kind of where my, my focus has been in terms of like my self growth and and focus on, you know, I guess, becoming more mindful and aware and, and writing things down and, I keep going back to this acupuncture thing, but you know, what, one of the things that I identified was like, I'm not good with the unknown in certain things. Yeah. Like I don't like, I, I get, I don't know if impatient is the word, but I get very, um, get very anxious when I'm waiting for the results of something. And that could be anything. It could be like, you know, I remember having it when I met my wife. Is she going to choose to be with me or is she not? And for months, even though we were dating and everything was good, I was so anxious about whether or not I was going to actually like lock it down. And, and yeah. that's a like, so it's, that's it a real, that. that's a real one. Yeah. I got you. It could be that. Yeah. Or it could be like, you know, I, um, I had to do these like 
scans for a couple of years for this, this very non-issue health thing. And it was like, every time I would go for a scan, it was like, what's going to happen? What are the results? I'm really nervous. Or like whenever I get bl- like my blood work done, like for normal, like a normal physical, like just waiting on those results, like kills me. So I was talking about this, with my acupuncturist, and she was like, the season of waiting is winter. She said, because in winter, everything that has been planted in the ground, you can't see and you don't know when it's going to come up. You don't know whether it's going to be successful growth of what you've, what you've planted or if it's not. And you can't draw conclusions and assumptions until you actually see what comes up. And when the sun comes out and the warmth hits, usually the things you worry about tend to take way more energy than they should. And when the harvest is ready and you've been so worried and depleted, you don't have enough energy to actually harvest the good that's come out. So the key to all of this is to stay still, stay steady during those periods of waiting so that when the harvest does come up, you have all the energy to deal with whatever the result may be. And I thought that was really prudent and also like really uh, just a, a really great sort of analogy to, to think back to. Definitely an acupuncture person. Like, de- like this person really lives it. Like that, yeah, that's great. She's really interesting. She used to be a, um, an oncology, uh, a radiation oncologist. What's oncologist? I was going to look uh, it up. Cancer. I just asked. So she, would, okay. she, would, she was a, a cancer doctor who focused on radiation and she... Um, that's got to be rough. Yeah, practiced a lot of like Eastern medicine and basically got into acupuncture and left her career doing that and now is completely into this other aspect of healing. So she's very wise and will impor- yeah. impart a lot of those sort of... Um, Good rounded too. Like Yeah, very That's great. So anyway... But that, like, that's just one example of like something that I will, I will now try to think of. Yeah, that, I mean, it's great. I, I like that example. And I think it's great that you're doing all these things to help you with things that come up in your personal life. And I mean, I'd be lying if I said I don't. I think a lot of those things people can relate and be like, oh, yeah, I get anxious on that, about those things. And I'm sure your ice baths and meditation now hopefully at least helps lower the extremes. But I was wondering, like, professionally, I mean, maybe you haven't had a chance to fully try out all your tools because of COVID, but I can't imagine anything worse than getting really anxious before you have to do your job. Has that happened to you in the past? Or do you kind of just go into muscle memory, like the zone? That, I, that's something I've never experienced anxiety with. Yeah. Like it's because it is so like, there's a lot of things that I think would freak people out that I really like. Like I yeah. like speaking in public. It doesn't, I don't get anxious or nervous. You're great. About that. Yeah. I, I just, I, I enjoy it. Right. Yeah. Um, performing in front of an audience. I enjoy it. So I look forward to it. And there's so much preparation before you get on stage, especially for my role within the band, like as the drummer, having to go record an album, basically when you, when you go through that process of learning your parts and writing your parts and recording it, you, it, that's when it becomes muscle memory. So by the time you get on stage, it's like, you're good, you know, yeah. at least for me. Oh yeah. Just- um, yeah, I think yeah, just go through the motions. Go through the motions. I think where I will probably have to exercise a lot of these coping mechanisms will be when I'm away for a longer period of time. And it's not about the performance, it's about like missing my kid or missing my wife or, you know, th- those things and like dealing with that those kinds of feelings. Because as you know, as much as there is a ton of stuff to do on the road, there's also a ton of downtime. And if you don't fill that space, then it's very easy to miss home or miss things or feel like the days are going very slowly. You bring in that ice bucket on tour? So, uh, yeah, not the one I have here, but yes, I want to um, I want to bring like a uh, like one of those horse troughs that you can get at like yeah, a tractor supply, 100 gallon tub. And I, th- I was thinking about it like, all right, it'll fit in one of the bays in the bus and I can put fill stuff inside it. it. Yeah. yeah, like well, that, but like you could, we could put like weights in it. We could put like workout gear, and it's a good storage <laughs> bin. And then all the venues we play have ice machines um, and water and water. Like there's always <laughs> a hose on the bus, and there's usually a, a spigot. So yeah, there's always there's always a way. So yeah, I oh, definitely man. thought about that. I thought about bringing like a portable sauna, like one of those little boxes that people sit in. I have one of those. So I didn't know about those. I'm gonna look into it. Yeah, you could do it right in your uh, right in your living room. Well. 
my living situation right now is I live in an apartment in LA and we do have a sauna at our apartment and it's not a nice sauna. It's not a nice apartment complex, but the sauna works. And I That's think great. I'm the only person who uses it. And we have a pool that is not heated in the winter. So I do have a cold dip as well. That's awesome. But yeah, gotta use them both, man. Dude, I think I messed my toe up doing cold dips. So I have to do some more research on it. My aunt, who's a nurse, explained to me what I did, but I think I uh, might have gone too hard in the cold dip world. So I'm going to have to <laughs> dial it back and do something different. But I do respect, enjoy, and am enjoying learning from you because, you know, I'm traveling down these roads and it, this has been great so far. Like I've learned so much and I'm excited to start doing some more. I'm going to get that stoic book. Yeah. Great book. Oh man. Well, I think I, I also wanted to take them. I mean, that kind of sums up most of the questions I had for you. I just, I guess overall, I'm just really impressed. Not that I expected anything and anything less, but I think that in band world or touring world, you know, people exist in extremes and on tour and they, and although, you know, you spoke to when you're doing all these things you're busy with, you don't experience your anxiety. But when you sit alone or COVID, you kind of experience these things come to life that you didn't know about. And I think for some people, they might always live in the touring world. And I don't know if they ever really get to deal with these things that do exist. And, you know, I'm kind of like, I didn't notice them till after I stopped touring. And it's kind of cool to know about all these things that, I mean, that other people are going through them. I don't really know where I'm going with this other than saying, cool, well have you, done. Well, have you, ex I mean... With the downtime, have you experienced yeah. some of these same kinds of uh, anxiety? Yeah, I mean, I think that I realized that I was existing in an anxious state constantly, although that anxious state allowed me to be productive. I was always excited and I need to be more relaxed. And it made like this, like I'd go on a full tour and I feel like I'd go through this whirlwind. And then I'd come home and I'd sit down and I'd be like, oh, what's going on? And I would try to like continue my tour life at home and that doesn't work. And we've all tried to do that. So yeah, I definitely s tried to slow everything down and be a little more intentional and develop all these skills that I think I kind of missed out on touring for 10, you know, for my twenties, I just toured and I missed out on a lot of skills that I'm kind of playing catch up on. So, but, uh, really fast, I wanted to say that, you know, we crossed paths initially, unless my memory fails me when you worked with me on TEI, which for people who don't know is like a workshop course on warp tour so people could kind of pay and then i do a workshop every day and i just wanted to say thank you because unlike you public speaking is really difficult for me and i learned so much through you guys on that and appreciate how much you pushed me and helped me and you know enabled me to do that and ultimately led me to this so thank you guys for everything you did i would seven never years have ago known now. that i would never What's... have known that because um, <laughs> you speak very well and you know it's funny i've always like you're i don't rem I, I feel like the first time we met I can't remember if it was on on one of the earlier warp tours or it was before that. You think? I don't. I, I don't. I, it's hard to say because I got emails. That's what I do. Yeah, I mean, every every time that we've crossed paths has been at some festival or show. Uh, so it's hard to pinpoint like when when the first time was. But I always remember it was just always a very positive meeting. Like we were always like very uh, gracious with each other, which was nice because uh, you don't you don't always get that with people on tour. <laughs> Yeah, it was a good vibe. Yeah, man, for sure. I um, there's one thing I wanted to wanted to just touch on that you were talking about, which is like when you're on tour, you're moving, you're moving, you're moving, you're moving, yeah. you're you're on the go, and then you get home and like I don't know, like I don't know if you can relate to this or elaborate on it further, but like that's one of the hardest things for me. Like even getting home from this past trip that I had when we went to Sweetwater, like the first day that I was back fully I was like I don't know if I felt depressed, but I just felt like man, like everything just slowed down instantly. Mm -hmm. Like, cause for that trip I was going, like we were up every morning at like 6am. Our first presentation was 730 in the morning and we would go all day and then you get home and it's like, not like that. It's way more leisurely and, and way less regimented. And it's very hard to try and sort of emulate that rigid fast paced schedule at home when they're just really, you don't have not there. So yeah. for me, it's like I always would get this like end of tour bout of like depression, for lack of a better word. So I'm just curious if if like you can relate to that too. Yeah, I mean, me and other people I've talked to, and I'm sure you've talked to other touring people about it too. I, I would describe feeling of being on tour as a high and I would describe the feeling of coming home as like a shock. And I think the best way I've kind of tried to handle it is when I'm on the road, I try to exist a little more intentionally and relaxed, even though it is exciting. I try not to get as excited. And that's not saying like I'm trying to make a good thing bad, 
I'm just trying to make it a little more calming. And then when I come home, I'm trying to find the same joy I find in touring and all these things that are, you know, pushing me in the daily things I have to do. From as easy as grocery shopping to cooking, like everything to me should be kind of a meditation in that regard where it's like, on tour, I think the reason I enjoy it so much is because I'm truly living in the now. I'm living in that moment and I'm putting my 100% into it because you can't do it any other way. It's so impossible. And then when I come home, I'm like, all right, what's going to distract me from these daily things I have to do? Rather than like, oh, I'm going to cook. I'm not going to, I'm just going to cook. And it's okay that it's not progressing me in some way professionally. And that's kind of how I put it in my head. Well, man, and especially for what you do, you capture moments. You, yeah. Like you have to be in the moment to yeah. capture it. And, yeah. and that takes, uh, it, it's a whole different discipline. It's a whole different thing than what I do. I mean, yeah, I'm playing. Yeah, I'm a stalker. But no, nah, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny. But no, I mean, like, I, I can imagine the, the type of focus that it takes to do what you do. Yeah. And, and the focus on, on the present, trying to catch that perfect instant that, you know, can, can live on forever, you know, in a photograph, right? It's just, I don't know, it, to me, it makes sense to me that you've tried to find that sort of balance with it when you do get home, because what you do on the road is truly so based on being in the present. And yeah. you, have to, you have to be able to relate to that at home without the camera and finding those ways to do that. And I think that's a really good discipline, really good thing to think about. So yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Well, thank you. It's sometimes it's sometimes it's nice to just say what you think and then hear somebody else who isn't you repeat it back to you. I think we've done that a few times, but it's so nice to like hear it interpreted in actual words and not just brainwaves. Well, and I've seen what you do, man, because it's like my impression of you on the road has always been I've always felt um always felt lucky to have those those few minutes where we can just catch up briefly before we both go and do something else because we're both busy. Yeah. But I've always felt like one you're able to be present with me. You're not the type of person that's like looking over my shoulder to see who else is in the room. I've always really appreciated that. And then two, at the same time, I have always respected how quickly we could keep things. For, because I always felt like, man, the more that I'm taking up your time, the less time you're catch, capturing a moment. Because at any time that we're talking, there's somebody performing. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know what you're saying. You know what I mean? Like that's a chance for you to be doing what you do. So I don't want to take that up. Oh, damn. I got to be mindful of that and tell people. I'm gonna be like, you're not taking up my time. I have nowhere to be. Let's talk. <laughs> well, just to be clear, that's not a bad, it, it's not a bad thing. It's just something yeah. that I've always like really uh, appreciated about you because I've, I know what you do and I see how on the move you are. And I, okay. I think it's always been appreciated. So yeah, anyway, just a, it's just, just, just an well, observation. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate that. That's very nice of you to say. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, dude, I, it's it's nice to talk about these kinds of topics. I, you know, I will say compared to other podcasts podcasts that I've been on where you don't get to talk about this stuff, it's nice to talk about it because in reality, this is sort of my present day, right? Like yeah. there's always things that are happening that are really good. And then there's always things that are happening that could be more ominous or like uncertain. And right now I'm going through a time where I'm just trying to like, navigate different challenges like in my life and some are big and some are small and to do it with anxiety and also a family and also a band and a business it's like finding the way to, to navigate and be okay yeah with what you're faced with is the biggest challenge and one of the things that i'm trying to do is just uh for lack of a better way to describe it it's just like dance with it all yeah balance it you just have to dance with it yeah well i think you got it for the time being, I mean, I know, you know, the feeling you're like, as soon as you're like, I got it. Then life is like, what about all these things? Oh, <laughs> Take dude. this one and figure it out. Never but it's ends. like, it's, I'm happy that you, I, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as me, because my goal for the podcast is to really talk about the things that I think the guest would enjoy and hopefully come away being like, wow, that was an hour. Let's fucking go. That was great. So this cool. was, this was amazing to listen to, by the way, Connor, I know he's left us visually, but I'm sure he'd enjoyed it as well. Right, Connor? Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> well, well awesome. I mean, we've been kind of serious this time. Well, not serious, but we, we've, we've had some good chats. But our question we always ask people is shower shoes or no shower shoes? That's oh, at the end. Shower, shower shoes. hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. Always. All right. Noted. Shower shoes and, you know, yeah, that sounds great. That sounds great. You know, everybody's very polarizing on that. I have not done shower shoes, but you, you'll just go first and I'll go after. Yeah, I do. Uh, I do the uh, 
You know what? Actually, I my Vans slip ones that I've had since like the first Warped Tour I ever like worked on. Yeah, are are still my shower shoes to this day. Slip ons meaning like flip flops or slip ons meaning? Yeah, yeah okay, cool. I'm yes, like yes, picturing yes. the slot. I'm like, those are real shoes, man. <laughs> no, 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 no. Flip flops, <laughs> flip flops. Um, and you know, it's funny referencing the 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 title of this podcast. You know, there there's ways around that too, um, if you do it the right way. So the hot bagging. <laughs> yeah, I've talked about this before, but yeah, there's other there's there's in my opinion there's way better ways to do it than what most people consider to be the traditional hot bag. So we'll talk, we can talk about that at another point, a little bit less disgusting of a topic or or a little more disgusting of a topic. Okay. We'll save that for next time. Yeah. There you go. All right. Thank you so much, Matt. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me.